With such a dramatic recent expansion of world currency supply and high inflation now eating away at its purchasing power, is hyperinflation, otherwise known as true currency destruction, a possible risk in the future? We're ending up with potentially, I think, a hyperinflation of the dollar, which was the outcome from the continental. The continental hyperinflated, went to zero value. Um, and it could very well happen to the dollar too if we don't get back on the right road. The world's major central banks have increased the global currency supply by nearly 50% since the COVID pandemic hit less than two years ago. Add in the additional trillions of dollars worth of fiscal stimulus issued recently by national legislatures around the world, and it's little surprise that price inflation is now raging. In short, our currency is losing its purchasing power at an alarming rate. So today, we talk with sound money advocate James Turk, the founder of Gold Money, to understand exactly what's going on. How much worse is this loss of purchasing power likely to get? And what can history tell us to expect from here? James, thanks so much for joining us today, all the way from London. Uh, great to be with you, Adam. Well, great to see you, James. And, and you've somebody, you're somebody who I've, I've listened to, watched, um, really since ever I got interested in this space, sort of back in the mid 2000s. Um, you are now at a stage where you uh, have been able to step away from all your operational duties and sort of be an eminence grease uh, in this space. Uh, you've just come out with a new book, which we'll talk about in just a second. But uh, to just kick things off at a high level, I have a question I like to ask all of my guests, and I'm going to tweak it just a little bit for you. What is your current assessment of global monetary policy? It's a mess. Um, and it's likely to get worse because we've abandoned the basic principles um, related to money and currency, and we're suffering the consequences um, as a result of that, um, which is really quite tragic because we're going through the same problems that the framers of the American Constitution went through with the collapse of the Continental, which was the first currency of the country. And they created the Constitution for a variety of different reasons, one of which was to create a common market, a common defense, and a common currency based on sound money. So the federal government was given by the states 17 specific powers. Um, one of those was to coin money and regulate the value thereof. So they could coin money, they couldn't print currency, they couldn't print banknotes, and regulate the value thereof meant that they could set the gold-silver ratio so that there was always sufficient gold and silver on hand for coinage purposes, because if the ratio got out of whack relative to market prices, um, the, the undervalued silver or the undervalued gold would be exported and the federal government wouldn't be able to coin money as is. Uh, as its responsibility stated under the Constitution. So they put that in the Constitution. It worked relatively well for 175 years or so. 20th century, uh, we moved further and further away from those uh, provisions. And you know we're ending up with potentially, I think, a hyperinflation of the dollar, which was the outcome from the continental. The continental hyperinflated, went to zero value. Um, and it could very well happen to the dollar too if we don't get back on the right road. Wow. Okay. So we'll get into this in a moment, but you think that there's the potential here for sort of a full-blown repeat of what happened to the Continental where its actual purchasing power went to zero over time. Yeah, I do believe that. Uh, we're on the wrong road heading in the wrong direction and no fiat currency, you know, currency based by nothing other than promises of government or promises of central bank. No fiat currency has ever existed throughout history. They've always eventually collapsed uh, because you've abandoned natural money, which of course is gold. Uh, gold provided the discipline that's necessary on the monetary process. And we don't have that with the fiat currency system today. And it's never been uh, implemented by any fiat currency throughout, uh, throughout history. They've all collapsed. So why should the dollar be any different? Okay, so we're getting into the themes of your, your new book here. I just wanna share the title for folks. Um, it is called Money and Liberty in the Pursuit of Happiness and the theory of natural money. And you just mentioned the term natural money. Uh, you referenced gold as an example of it. We'll, we'll get more deep into that in, in a bit here, but um, I, I wanna just start first with a couple of terms. So you just defined uh, fiat money for people. Um, you talk about the difference of money and currency. So if you could define maybe three terms for us, 
could you define or two things, the difference between money and currency? And when we talk about sound money, what do you mean by sound money? Okay. Um, you know, we in the 20th century, we, we started to use these two terms differently, money, uh, uh, the same way, money and currency. We mean them, uh, they, they tend to mean the same thing, but in fact, they're very different. Uh, currency only came into existence in the 17th century with the formation of banks uh, in London. Uh, it was needed because when people deposited their money, their, their gold and silver coins into the bank, they came away with a paper banknote or a bank statement of account. And they knew that they no longer had money, they had something different. And that something different was currency. It had different risks associated with it that you didn't have with money. So throughout the uh, 18th and 19th century, that difference was well understood between money and currency, but we lost the distinction of that in the 20th century with abandoning gold in 1914 at the outbreak of the First World War. But the risks, of currency are still there. And the main risk, of course, is counterparty risk, as we found in various banking crises throughout the, throughout the 20th century, going back to the Great Depression. Um, if you had money in a bank that failed, um, you, you lost that money because of counterparty risk. Um, same thing in other instances. If you had money with a, a, a hedge fund or a brokerage firm that failed, you lost that money. 2008 was all about counterparty risk because of all of the derivatives that were created by the various institutions. And people were concerned about the safety of their wealth. So they wanted to move away from counterparty risk into, into the safety of things as opposed to promises. And that's the key difference between money, it's a thing, it's a tangible asset versus currency, which is always a promise. So currencies have a lot of risk associated with them that money does not. Fiat currency is basically just currency that is not even tied to a, an asset. Uh, an asset. Yeah, originally, under the gold standard, when you deposited your coins into a bank, uh, you received a bank note or a bank statement, and the, the currency was tied to the assets that the, that the bank had um, received in the deposit. Today, there's no specific tie to the bank's assets. And we don't really know what the bank's assets are anymore because it's not gold and silver coin on deposit, it's safe and secure in a vault. It's a variety of different loans to all kinds of different borrowers. So we don't know whether those borrowers are good borrowers or bad borrowers. Um, and we saw in 2008, for example, a lot of the debts that the banks had were bad. And I'm sure today there are a lot of bad debts in the banks as well too. And that's why I tend to think we're going heading for another financial crisis. So it's a bit of a long answer to your question, but we have to distinguish between money on the one hand and currency on the other. And when I talk about money, sound money and money in my mind are the same thing. It's gold and silver coin. Okay, and gold and silver coin, obviously I think you mentioned this briefly earlier, but that was what the constitutional framers actually put in the constitution as the only acceptable form of money in the country. Um, but yet we have somehow divorced ourselves from that requirement. Exactly. And th this term currency has been now stretched to all types of different ways that was never envisioned uh, in terms of the framework that was structured by the framers. And it gets down to purchasing power. Um, it, there are two specific types of purchasing power. You've got purchasing power that's earned, and you've got purchasing power that's a phantom purchasing power created by bank accounting. So to use an example on this, uh, if you work for a year and you make $50,000, uh, you've earned that purchasing power. So you can then interact in commerce, fulfilling your needs and wants with that purchasing power, which we convey historically in money, but today only convey in terms of currency. Uh, what the banks do is they create phantom purchasing power. This is what the government does as well in terms of issuing paper notes. Uh, phantom purchasing power doesn't come from hard work, it just comes from bank accounting. But here's the real issue on this, Adam. You may remember several years ago when Ben Bernanke was chairman of the Federal Reserve, he said he could drop dollars from helicopters in order to put currency into the system. The problem with that is that you can drop current dollars from helicopters, but you, you aren't creating more goods and services. And as a consequence, you've got more currency chasing the same amount of goods and services, and that results in price inflation. And that's what we're seeing today. Because over the past couple of years, there's been a tremendous amount of dollars created, and we're now starting to see the impact of those dollars as they circulate through the economy. 
the quantity of dollars grew much, much more quickly than the output of goods and services available for purchase. All right, so um, let's just throw some numbers against this. So uh, I looked at uh, Yardini Research's website before this, uh, this interview and looked at the growth in central bank balance sheets, which is sort of a way to measure uh, the increase in currency supply. And if you look at them uh, right before, well, let me put it this way: uh, if <laughs> they were collectively the, the the world's largest central banks um, had a cumulative balance sheet total of about twenty trillion at the start of twenty twenty, uh, before the pandemic hit. Uh, here we are now, almost two years, not quite two years away from there. We're now at over thirty one trillion, right? So it's been an over fifty percent increase in global bank balance, central bank balance sheets in less than two years. Um, and if you go back to right before the 2008 global financial crisis, that cumulative total was six trillion, maybe even a little bit less. So we're now over five times where we were uh, pre-2008. So we're what, only 14 years away from that? So a 5x increase in only 14 years. Are we seeing your worst case scenario play out here globally right now? I think we are, and I think we're pretty close to the point in time uh, where the system is going to collapse. But I want to preface that by saying that, you know, historically the system is based on the premise of inflate or die. You know, you inflate and you, you sort of control the inflation. That's what Paul Volcker did as when it got out of hand. He controlled the inflation and brought it back down. But this inflate and die system that we have has changed because of the amount of debt that we now have in the system. And as a consequence, what we're going to see going forward is more regimentation, inflation and regimentation. The regimentation is needed to keep this broken system working. And we've already seen a lot of this regimentation in terms of how much money you can carry, how many, how much, how many dollar bills you can carry in your pocket when you go across the border. Uh, we also see it in terms of the financial repression that central banks are imposing on interest rates. They're reducing the cost of capital well below natural levels. Uh, and as a consequence, that's having an impact uh, as well. So this regimentation that's being imposed by government and central banks is likely to increase as we go forward, which means less liberty, less freedom for individuals to act, uh, less capitalism, more uh, socialism, more fascism, actually. Um, and that's very, very worrying because we've moved away from basic principles that made America what it is. Uh, okay. And by the way, uh, I, I wasn't exactly sure how this conversation was going to go. I'm sure we're kind of uh, freaking a couple of people out here <laughs> uh, in terms of what's happening with, uh, you know, one of the underlying pillars of our way of life, which is our, our money. Um, and now you're getting into but, the freedom side of it. Um, so let kind me of ask along... you, but be before we get into the freedom side of this, uh, you know, we have to think about, look, I'm 75 years old, growing up in the 1950s, the thought was always amongst Americans, amongst my parents, amongst my friends' parents, that the younger generation would always live better than their parents. The parents would always um, see their, their kids grow, grow and live in an environment that was better than they themselves lived in. We've lost that. Um, children today are looking for jobs. They're struggling with student debt. They don't have the opportunities that my generation had or previous generations of Americans had. Uh, so, you know, things are fundamentally different today. And I think we need a wake up call. Uh, aside from, you know, the uh, monetary aspects, just look at what life is um, progressing, uh, environmental degradation and things of this nature. We need some changes. We need some wake up calls. And it starts with money. You need sound money to run an ethical society. And we don't have sound money anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that money provides, a very important function that it provides, is, is, is a signaling function, right? Where it basically tells us where value is and where value isn't. And when you start sort of mixing those signals up and confusing them, um, the system doesn't know how to operate properly and you get all sorts of, of bad knock-on effects from that and you know the Austrians would say malinvestment it's a term that they use but it's very much an outcome of, of the confusion of price signals um, but but to pull more in the thread you're talking about here James because um, this is where I wanted to take it which is uh, there's a lot of unfairness in the type of intentional 
currency inflation uh, that that's happening right now, where uh, uh, it's the Cantillon effect, right? Which is uh, the the people uh, that benefit from that that currency inflation are the people basically with greatest and first access to it, right? That can spend those new dollars. Right. Kind of at their current purchasing power before the market wakes up to realize that that there's a lot more dollars out there now, and um, we sort of have a, a double barrel effect against what I would I would basically say is almost sort of the bottom ninety nine percent. So I mean, we're we're not talking about kind of a, 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 a evenly bifurcated system here. We're talking about one where there is a very small number of people that are benefiting tremendously from this, and then everybody else is really you know getting net punished in this. So um, uh, I've mentioned this stat recently on this program before, but it's something like 10% of the country owns 89% of the financial assets, right? So when um, asset prices get distorted by all of this new currency flooding into the system, um, it's a very small number of people relatively that benefit from that. At the same time, that flood of new currency is also you know, driving up the prices of everything, driving up the cost of living. So to your point, um, you know whether it's really interesting. We can look at both ends of the democrat uh, de demographic spectrum. Uh, the uh, the uh, oh gosh, what was the term used? Um, the regimentation um, effects. So uh, depressing uh, interest rates is really killing uh, seniors that in previous generations would live off of fixed income, you know, in their elderly years, they, they'd park their capital into safer investments and just live off a dependable fixed income. They can't do that anymore with interest rates this low. On the other end of the demographic spectrum, you know, you've got the young who are getting punished for saving because they're not getting any, any return for it. Uh, and they're having trouble even creating excess savings to, to even potentially save or invest with because the cost of living has gone up so fast. That they really are having a harder and harder time just affording the basics of life. So there's a real sort of social unfairness there. I see you nodding as I'm saying all this. I don't think any of this is super new to the, the viewers here. But again, you're a student of history, James. Uh, what is this? What does history tell us here? I mean, do we do we get to some sort? At some point, we must get to a breaking point where the populace just says, "I got nothing left to lose. This system isn't working. I got to stand up and, and demand a better system." Yeah, you can go the right way or you can go the wrong way. Uh, the wrong way, of course, is you have a social breakdown and you end up like Venezuela. The right way is you have a plan and go back on the right road, which America did once before after the war between uh, the North and the South. The, uh, the fiat currency at the time was called the greenbacks. And you know the, the federal government recognized that it was unconstitutional, but they needed it to, uh, in their view, in order to save the union. Uh, and they had a plan. Uh, they put together, Congress put together a plan. Uh, in 10 years, they were going to go back onto uh, the, the silver standard that was prevailing at the time. Uh, and they did. Uh, so, I mean, it's not like we don't know what needs to be done. It's just that the political will is, is missing. The leadership is missing to go back in the right direction. And you hit upon something that's, I think, most people don't understand that, you know, when currency is debased like this, you're actually stealing people's time, which is their most precious asset on earth. You know, if you work all year and at the end of the year, the purchasing power that you'd hope to learn is less than what it was actually, uh, what your expectation was because of central bank or government mismanagement and debasement of the currency, your time is being stolen. And this is actually if you look at the readers, uh, the writers during the age of enlightenment, including the framers of the constitution, they considered it a crime against humanity to debase the currency. So when the Mint Act was first passed by Congress in 1792, which is one of the first acts of Congress after the constitution had been uh, formed and created and, and the United States was reestablished under a constitutional government, um, in order to fulfill its responsibility of coining money, they created the Mint Act. And the Mint Act says that if you just uh, debase uh, or debauch the currency, um, you're punishable by death. That's how serious it was deemed to be up until the 20th century. Uh, and central banks have come around, around with this propaganda that by inflating the currency 2% or 5% or 10%, whatever the inflation rate happens to be presently, that's supposed to be a good thing. But it's actually a bad thing because it disrupts society. 
you have to be able to interact with other people with sound money in order to have an ethical and moral society. We've moved away from that because of central banks and banking, the way it's become practiced. All right, so we've lost this, what I would perceive to be a, you know, incredibly valuable and probably very hard won lesson um, from previous uh, societies you know, that said, look, if you, uh, if you bastardize your monetary system, you know, bad things happen. And so you know, we passed these acts early in the lifetime of this country saying, hey, we know what happens when we go down that route. We want to put these strong legal guardrails in place to make sure we don't head down that path again. Well, we looks like we've removed those guardrails in the 20th century. We are where we are. So you, you, you sort of just said, uh, James, that we could go one way or the other. We could do it the right way or the wrong way. Uh, given your scope of history, given your understanding of where things are right now, project out from here. How do you think this is gonna get resolved? That's, you know, you can't predict the future. Um, I know. I'm just asking you to guess here. This is not yeah. not 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 a uh, not a prediction, just a, a, a guesstimate. Well, all you can really do is uh, prepare for an uncertain future, and you prepare for an uncertain future by, of course, owning um, uh, physical gold, and physical silver as as a form of sound money. If you look historically, uh, just numerically, most situations end up badly uh, rather than the right way. You know, in the 1780s, uh, after the continental collapse, America's experience was that they went the right way. The framers of the constitution established a sound mon monetary system. They, they erected those guardrails to make certain that we would not go off on a tangent again like they did during the war for independence. Um, on the other hand, Germany in the 1920s went the bad way. You know, Their currency got destroyed. Um, and as a consequence, it led to fascism and ultimately World War II. There's been a lot of analysis suggesting that there was a direct causal relationship between the, society, the societal uh, a collapse of the, um, because of the collapse of the currency uh, in the 1920s. So let's hope that we go the right way, but we always have to prepare in case we don't. And one way to prepare is to have a well-balanced portfolio, um, which I think is principally focused toward tangible assets rather than financial assets. In other words, own things rather than currency denominated promises. Great, yes, things that have an intrinsic value um, versus paper claims that, that could be debased in the way that you've been talking about here. Um, all right, I wanna get in just a exactly. second. Exactly, let me just add to, the, yeah. let me just add to that too, Adam, that uh, there's, what about stocks? Well, stocks can be either a financial asset if you own a bank stock, or a near tangible asset if you own a mining company with a lot of you know, good uh, tangible assets. So you have to really look at individual shares to determine you know, which one makes sense for you. Uh, and ultimately, how do you balance your portfolio in such a way that you sleep well at night? Because that's, what, that's really what it's all about at the end of the day, that you and your family are protected, come what may. Great, and, and I actually wanna get more specific with you about that in just a second. Um, one point I just wanted to make was, you know, even when, even if your example of having gone the right way, right, which is what we decided to do in the 1780s, um, we had just done it the wrong way. Um, we had we had just witnessed the collapse of the continental, right, and that pain was still in the national consciousness, and people could say, okay, yes. look, that didn't work. You know, let's do something smarter going forward. Um, I'm not putting words in your mouth here, but I wonder. Um, you know, I, I just don't see us have the having the political will, given the way in which America and most other governments are run right now, um, where the politicians would say, you know what, we're going to take some austerity and some, some immediate pain uh, to get to a, a more sustainable long-term solution. Um, I think it's probably going to take some sort of breakage, um, like the collapse of the Continental or something like that, to really put enough pressure on politicians to change their ways. You might have a different opinion. Uh, I'll let you share it in a second. I just want to flag this because um, for folks that haven't seen it yet, um, did a phenomenal interview with Neil Howe, uh, who's the famous demographer um, who wrote the book, The Fourth Turning. And um, both examples that James just mentioned there um, either came out of or presaged a fourth turning event. Um, so the war, American War for Independence was a, a fourth turning period, as was World War II. Um, and uh, I just want to tie in people's minds here the importance of currency, because in both of those fourth turnings, 
you know, what was going on with the currency was a, a, a very pivotal development. And in both cases, too, there ended up being pretty wide scale uh, military conflict as, as uh, part of a path that led to the resolution. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily going to happen from here, but that's one of the potential risks. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put up a link to it right here. Um, all right, James, let me let, let me let me hand it back to that, you. That's Feel free a, to comment that's on a great, I just said, and then we'll get into your investing ideas. That that's a great book, by the way. It's about just six feet away from my from my hand here. I've got it right at the top of my library. I have a very high regard for both both gentlemen who wrote that book, uh, and I reference it. Uh, you know, from time to time, just to go back and look and see. And I, I, I just am amazed as how accurate some of their predictions actually have turned out to be. So I, I highly regard, uh, regard both of them. I definitely recommend reading that book. It's a fantastic book. Uh, great. Well, that's high praise coming from you. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, I'm sure Neil will love to hear that. Um, all right. So uh, I do want to get into the practical steps for people. Um, but real quickly, just to sort of finish out the high level view here. Um, I guess two, two, two questions for you I want to get to. One is um, uh, you've, you've called gold natural money. I'd like you just to expand just a little bit more on exactly what that term means to you. And then secondly, okay. do you see at some point here gold, gold and silver, et cetera, um, coming back and playing a role as money? going forward in some way, shape, or form? Okay, well, let me do the second question first. You know, gold's been money for 5,000 years. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. It, it is money, but 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 uh, you know, sovereign money, uh, again. Oh, it, you mean in terms of governments? Well, they'll either go back to it willingly or the government or the market will force them to go back to it one way or the other. So yeah, we'll, gold will reemerge at the center of global commerce at some point, some point in time in the future. Let's hope we get to get to that uh, event in a peaceful and harmonious way without a lot of side uh, disruption to society. Uh, I'm hopeful that will be the outcome. And you know, as people become educated about the flaws of the present system, maybe that will be a likely outcome, but we'll just have to wait and see. Now, with regard to gold being natural money, uh, I think this is probably best described with an example. Um, you know, we talk about gold preserving purchasing power over long periods of time. So let's look at crude oil as representative of energy, which is important to our society, the way we live and our civilization. An ounce of gold today buys basically the same amount of crude oil it did in 1950, you know, seven decades ago. Um, there have been reports that, you know, a, an ounce of gold um, or a cold 45 buys, uh, costs the same in terms of gold today as it did in, in the 1880s in the Wild West. Why does gold do this? It's basically because the above ground stock of gold, which is um, a cube that you could fit under the arches of the Eiffel Tower, grows by about one and three quarters percent per annum consistently year after year after year. Um, and that's approximately the same as world population growth. So you have this natural supply and demand between uh, uh, in commerce between the population and the supply of gold. This is what Milton Friedman uh, wrote about in terms of what he called his K percent rule. He was not a gold guy, but he understood that you had, you had to have uh, currency growing at approximately the same as population growth. Um, he never actually fixed what was the ideal number, but it really one and three quarters is in my mind, the ideal number because why does gold still have the same amount of purchasing power today in terms of energy as it did in 1950. You know, there's a lot more people today and there's a lot more gold, but the gold stock uh, grows by about one and three, uh, one and three quarters percent per annum. And so you have this consistency and that's what makes gold money. It's not an investment because over those seven decades, you don't have more purchasing power today than you did in 1950. You buy the same amount of energy today as you did back then. Um, so gold is money, it's preserving purchasing power. And that's one of the key functions of what money is supposed to do. So it's what I call natural money because basically nature provides everything humanity needs to advance, including money and gold is nature's money. We have to go back to that understanding which we did throughout the you know, history all the way back to prehistory um, that gold has always been money and we've lost sight of that in the 20th century 
because governments and central banks found it to their advantage to move away from gold. They didn't like the discipline that gold opposed on their spending. Um, and as a consequence, the 20th century turned out to be one of the bloodiest uh, in history, if not the, well, it is the bloodiest century in history in terms of the wars that were fought, not by earned purchasing power, but by phantom purchasing power created by central banks. Yeah, and that last point I think is really probably poorly understood by many people, but a lot of those wars were funded by expansion of the currency system, which essentially was pulling prosperity from the future into today and allowed them to afford to have a war they couldn't otherwise do if, uh, if, if being subject to the limits of sound money. Exactly. Um, That's what phantom purchasing power does. It tricks the human mind into thinking that you're wealthier than you really are. And when you have that kind of uh, event happening, it tends to lead to well, it could lead to war, but it can just generally lead to overconsumption. So one of the points I make in the book is that a lot of the environmental degradation today has occurred because of overconsumption, because central banks have distorted the cost of capital by keeping interest rates at an artificially low level. So yeah, and in, in many know, ways, comes... I was just going to say, in many ways, that plays to the worst of human nature, right? Evolutionarily, we're wired to... Uh, instantly consume as many resources as we can, right? We want to eat all the fruit that's on the tree right now because it might not be there tomorrow, right? So, right. Uh, you know, we, we have this evolutionary proclivity to um, want to do as much as we maximize our current present situation, sort of tomorrow be damned. And of course, uh, tomorrow always comes. And so you're going to wake up with a hangover of that. So it's uh, in, in many ways, it's sort of like, uh, uh, you know, fiat money uh, provides sort of the the cheap alcohol that you can spike today's punch with, but you you generally regret it when you wake up the next morning. Um, yeah, but we you know we okay. learned as kids you know the, the the story of the grasshopper or the ant or whatever they they were yep. that you know we want things today, but we also have to plan for the future. We have to save. Uh, we have to live uh, consciously, ethically, uh, morally, um, in order to get along with society, live in society in a in a fair and equitable way. Um, and we have to get back to that. All right. So I, I want to get uh, I want to get into sort of you know the ask, your recommendations on ways people might want to consider holding gold, how much they should hold, metals versus miners, any other assets that you particularly like. I want to get to that in just a minute. But first, and I'm sure you expected this question was coming. Um, you know, you you basically said, hey, look, we've got this great natural solution that's we've been leveraging for thousands of years and it's worked. We've somehow deviated from that. You know, we're seeing the negative impacts of that deviation. Um, so why don't we just go back and re-embrace gold? And uh, there's a camp of people who would say, uh, hey, I, I, I totally agree with you about everything you just said, James, but we can come up with an even better currency now because of the crypto blockchain platform where you know, we can basically design what we consider to be the perfect money. Um, do you have an opinion on cryptos as a solution here? Yeah, I, I do. And I you know, write about it in the book, as you know. Um, it's interesting that Satoshi Nakamoto, the guy who's uh, invented Bitcoin and created the whole cryptocurrency uh, atmosphere environment, um, used gold as the model on which to base his, um, his uh, Bitcoin. And that, I think that tells you a lot. Um, it, what I explained in the book is that I've been, we used to, in gold money back in the early days before social media, we had a what I call a bulletin board where people would write in and we would discuss various things related to money and currency. And we had a lot of people from the cypherpunk community. We had some government snoops, I'm sure, trying to understand the new technology that was being developed because of the internet. Uh, and a lot of people who just wanted to know, you know what's the future of money likely to be. And one of the things we frequently discussed in that, uh, in that bulletin board was, wouldn't it be great if there was a type of currency that couldn't be confiscated by government? Because gold has been confiscated repeatedly throughout history by government. Well, not repeatedly, but often, let's say. In the 20th century, it was confiscated by Lenin, Hitler, Mussolini, and Franklin Roosevelt. And who's to say it couldn't be confiscated again in the future as if push comes to shove, which is why you want to have diversification. But getting back to the point, the discussion of this group that we had 
um, was that it would be great if there was a currency that could be like gold, but not confiscated. And I think that it's very possible that whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is could have been one of those cypherpunks that was um, uh, targeted, uh, that was part of that, uh, On that bulletin board. list we used to run yeah, years ago. Uh, anyway, um, so the way I see the currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies and gold is we're on the same side fighting the fiat currency guys. And cryptocurrencies and gold are complementary complementary to one another in the sense that the advantages of gold are the disadvantages of cryptocurrency and vice versa. So for example, I, made, I mentioned that gold can be confiscated and has been confiscated. Cryptocurrency cannot. So the disadvantage of gold is offset by the advantage of cryptocurrency. On the other hand, the advantage of gold is you have money that you own and can hold in your hand. Um, you can't hold a cryptocurrency in your hand and it's reliant on a complex system of farming and electricity generation and a whole variety of other issues. So that's it, cryptocurrency's disadvantage. My guess is, is the way this is going to evolve is that people who are using cryptocurrency today will come to understand that there's a better system out there than cryptocurrencies. And that system is basically digital gold. Gold stays in the vault, but circulates in commerce by clicking the ownership the title of a weight of gold from the payer to the payee. And as a consequence, you could uh, conduct commerce in that way. This was the basis of the patents that I got in the 1990s that was um, uh, sort of a Back part with of your, your gold to, grams? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Part of the impetus to start gold money back in 2001. Um, so my guess is that I see cryptocurrencies as an educational tool and a stepping stone to something better. And that's something better is ultimately going to be, you know, digital gold currency. I, I don't really know. Of course, we're speculating about how things are going to evolve. But the bottom line is that we should be encouraging innovation of all sorts in order to make a better system than what we've got today. And having government regulation uh, and imposition of all kinds of restrictions on these new innovations that people are trying to um, develop it uh, is wrong. We should be encouraging these new innovations and let the market decide what is the best um, uh, system. And it shows that that itself shows the flaws of the current system when you think of banks being too big to fail. If you have a capitalist system, nothing is too big to fail. Failure is part of capitalism, that's part of entrepreneurship. You know, some people have an idea, they pursue it, and if the market likes the idea, they wrap their arms around it and the entrepreneur makes money. If they don't like the idea, the entrepreneur will try something else perhaps, but the idea will you know, be an idea that didn't succeed. That's the essential nature of capitalism. And we're moving away from that when you have restrictions on innovation in payments. Um, and that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about the lending and the borrowing. We're talking about the payments because banks have essentially two functions. Of course, they do the lending and the borrowing, uh, but the real, fun the real function that is important to banks is the payment system. That's digital. That's the currency that's on their balance sheets that moves around by check, uh, wire transfer, plastic cards, and now they're talking about central bank, you know, crypto or central bank digital right. currency. Because they can they can collect a fee on every one of those transactions, right? Exactly, and apparently forty percent of the bank's income comes from the payments business. You know, if you've ever sent a wire transfer and spent twenty five. $30 on a wire transfer, you know, you know how expensive making payments in the, this antiquated banking system that goes back to 1694 with the formation of the Bank of England. Um, it, it's based on mercantilist principles that have long been discredited, but somehow these banks, because of government protection, continue to operate. Uh, we need the technology to change this, reduce the cost of payments, which is a good thing, because the more opportunity the less costs there are to interacting with other individuals, the more commerce there's going to be, the more commerce you want, um, because that ultimately leads to new products and services and raises everyone's standards of living. So by restricting banks and um, uh, restricting commerce to you know, bank payment systems and um, making it difficult for these new innovators to uh, um, introduce their ideas to commerce is actually hurting the development and advancement of humanity. Yeah, uh, well, I can't disagree with you there. And of course, that's part of the whole mission of, of DeFi 
the DeFi movement in the crypto space, right? Is to basically right. disintermediate right. all those banks. Um, all right, so two, two quick things. Um, one, uh, I, I really appreciate your, your viewpoint there, James, um, because uh, I've found that, uh, you know, I'm still educating myself on the cryptocurrency space and it's actually a journey I'm gonna take the wealthy on audience uh, on, a, on a deeper look uh, here in 2022 to really understand the applications of this technology. Um, but I found in my explorations to date that, uh, you know, people can be pretty dogmatic about this. You know, the Bitcoin guys or the crypto, a lot of crypto people can say, look, you gold guys don't get it. You're dinosaurs. It's an old relic. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the precious metals group can equally say, um, you know, you guys are just inventing stuff that has no real value. Um, it's just completely ephemeral. Um, and uh, I think it's obviously much more nuanced than that. And I think your point of, of us, everybody being on the same side of the fight uh, is both accurate and very unifying. Um, and if I can sort of put words in your mouth, it, it seems like right now, you know, sort of speculating, you see eventually the ability for sort of a hybrid solution here where you've got kind of, uh, you know, crypto elements wrapped around uh, physical gold storage. Um, and I know some companies are out there in the space trying to do exactly just that. Um, uh, we'll see what happens, but I think you're, I'm right there with you when you're saying sort of like, let's let innovation thrive. Let's let a thousand flowers bloom and let's let the best horses win. Now, of course, uh, and you were sort of saying this, um, governments um, have always sort of tried to strangle competition. Um, I always use the example of, of the guy who would be, you know, banging out silver rounds in his garage and have the FBI, you know, bust the door in and throw him in jail because the U.S. government just wants to say, look, we're the only ones that create uh, sovereign currency here. And I've always been a little bit interested as to why they sort of let the cryptocurrency community get to the critical point of critical mass it's gotten to. Um, and we don't need to necessarily go down the rat hole of the reasons, but, um, but certainly it has, uh, cryptocurrency has proven itself um, as a technology and as a, a, a viable model. And of course, the central banks can then create their own version, right? These central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. Um, I guess my question for you, and I don't want to spend too much time on the side of the ledger, but um, A, do you see CBDCs as inevitable? And if you do, do you see the governments trying to maybe then crack down more, more aggressively against the other potential competing forms of money, whether they be crypto-based or not? Yeah, I do. It's part of my thinking in terms of more regimentation. Uh, they will do more and more things to try to maintain this special position that they have where they can create currency out of thin air, phantom purchasing power out of thin air, um, and then spend that phantom purchasing power in order to achieve whatever their objectives happen to be. So yeah, I think um, CB, central bank digital currencies are probably inevitable. Um, and I think you're going to see more of that in the year, next year, this year, and maybe next year ahead. It's a question of what happens first. Uh, does the market totally reject national currencies before the central bank digital currency can ever come into existence? Uh, so it's, we've got a little bit of a race going on here. Uh, it could very well be that you know central bank fiat currencies collapse before they ever have a chance to create any kind of a, um, a, um, a digital currency. But one other point about this that I think is important. Um, if you love liberty, you love gold or cryptocurrencies, uh, that's, that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation are the statists, those who want to continue the system of fiat currency um, and government regimentation. Uh, so that's the divide. And I think that's going to become increasingly clear in the year, uh, years ahead. Yeah, well, my guess is, is that if inflation continues to you know, uh, rage as hot as it's been um, for too much longer, uh, a lot more people are going to cross the line from the status over to the, the Liberty side, because they're just, uh, yeah. they're gonna have to, if they wanna you know, have a chance of being able to uh, afford any prosperity in their future. Um, all right, so let's, let's sort of conclude here, James, um, by you know, trying to make this practical for the, the average viewer here. Um, so it's clear that you uh, are a proponent of the precious metals. Um, I know you own a company, Gold Money, that helps people invest in them. Um, but if you could just sort of give your general advice on how you think people should 
A, own precious metals, and B, you know, if there are any other asset classes out there that you particularly like. Um, you talked about mining shares as an example, but you talked about hard assets in general. So are there other asset classes uh, within that umbrella that you, you think are wise? Um, it, 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 yeah, and I guess, I guess the concluding question, which you can wrap into your answer is just, you know, for the, the concerned investor who is looking to protect and maybe prudently grow their wealth, given what's coming ahead, you know, what advice do you have to offer them? Okay, uh, well, let's look at a portfolio in two different ways, uh, or divided, uh, so that we can talk about both components of a portfolio. You have investments and you have cash. You know, sometimes we say you have stocks and cash, but really you have investments and you have cash. When you talk about cash, you're talking about liquidity. Now, when you're talking about liquidity, you're talking about gold, silver, dollars, euros. British pounds, Swiss francs, you know, which liquidity is going to maintain your purchasing power the best over any period of time relative to the risks associated with that particular form of currency. Um, and when it comes to owning gold, the way I generally look at it is that the older you are, the less risk you want to take. So the more um, gold you want to own as a percentage of your liquidity. So if you have um, let's say if you're 30 years old, you may want to have just 30% of your liquidity in gold. Um, but it, a little bit flexible when you're younger because you can make mistakes when you're younger uh, and have time to you know, uh, re-earn what you might lose uh, as you learn more about portfolio management and, and investing and you know, what types of assets you want to own. But definitely as you get older, you want to have the bigger percentage of your liquidity. I'm not talking about investments here because you know gold is money. It's not an investment, as I've already explained. Uh, you want to have more of your portfolio, your liquidity uh, part of your portfolio in gold. So, for example, I'm in my mid 70s, so 75% of my liquidity, at least, uh, is in is in gold, uh, and I'm very very comfortable with that because, like I said, gold's been around for 5,000 years. Um, it continues to buy the same amount of crude oil it did 70 years ago, regardless of what government thinks about gold. Uh, it has advantages in terms of maintaining that liquidity for me. And it's there without any contingency because it's physical, it's a tangible asset. So that's the way I view the liquidity part of one portfolio, one's portfolio. Now, if you wanna look at the investment part of one portfolio, I'll say right up front, I'm not a, um, a specialist uh, in investments other than um, I would say that you really want to have more of your investments focused today on tangible types of things rather than uh, any types of financial assets denominated in, in a currency. So stay away from um, uh, bonds, stay away from bank accounts, stay away from you know insurance policies, things of that nature. Um, and tend to Move ten, uh, tend to move toward things that are more tangible of the nature. Um, and by tangible of the nature, I'm talking about stocks of companies that are near tangible, like an agribusiness company or a mining company, uh, farmland, um, uh, apartment buildings, if you can be certain of generating the cash flow to cover your costs from an apartment building and things of that nature. Own your own factory rather than leasing the building. Uh, so that's the that's the way I would structure a portfolio. Okay, uh, and that's really useful. And what's nice about that is uh, I, I know you say that you're not a, uh, a, a professional financial advisor, uh, but your advice does jive both with a lot of the experts that I've interviewed on this channel recently, as well as the professional financial advisors that Wealthion does have uh, relationships with and, and connects people with. Um, and uh, you, two things that you, mentioned there that I just want to surface for folks. One is, um, you know, invest in more tangible, more real, I'd probably also say less financialized uh, mm -hmm. businesses. Um, and so where you actually hopefully have a claim in some way, shape or form along the chain on something real, right? You know, metal in the earth, timber on the farmland, uh, a building that people are living in, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so I think that's important. And you also mentioned income, right? Where um, you know real estate was the example you used. But in an inflationary environment, 
ideally you want to have uh, investments that pay you an inflation adjusting income stream right so that your yield uh, isn't getting eaten away by the inflation it's, it's keeping pace with it in an apartment is generally a pretty good example of that. You can you can raise rates as the inflation you can raise your rents as the inflation rate uh, rises. Right. Um, all right. Excellent. Well, look, uh, James, this has been a, a, an excellent conversation. Um, it's great to see you again after so many years, and it's great to see that you are still uh, just the uh, very eloquent and uh, and an incredibly wise uh, monetarist uh, that I've always known you to be. Um, for people who are interested in reading your new book. Where can they go get a copy of it? It's called Money and Liberty in the Pursuit of Happiness and the Theory of Natural Money. Just look for Money and Liberty, and you can find it on Amazon. It's both available in the uh, ebook, which can be read on a Kindle app, as well as a paperback. All right. Um, well, thanks so much, Jim. And uh, I really hope to have you back on the program here. I know that you are um, you know, enjoying the fruits of, of, of we'll call it semi-retirement. Um, but uh, I, I really value you taking the time to talk with us here and love to have you back on the program uh, when you can be. And uh, if, if folks want to follow you and your work, um, is there a place they can do that these days or should they just kind of keep their eyes out for the occasional interview that you grant the world? Uh, I do. You can follow me on Twitter, um, uh, FGMR, at FGMR for free gold money report. Or you can go to my website, uh, fgmr.com, freegoldmoneyreport.com. Uh, occasionally I'll post an article there and you can also see all of the tweets there. Um, and uh, usually when I'm tweeting, I'll tell you if there's an interview that I'm doing so that everybody can tune into that particular interview. All right, great. I'll put the URL for your, your website and your Twitter handle up on the site here when we edit this. All right, James, thanks so much for joining us. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Adam. If you enjoyed this discussion with James Turk, well, then I've got an extra bonus for you. After we recorded the main interview, James started answering one of the most common questions people ask him. So if currency debasement is going to get worse from here, should I then load up on debt now to buy assets and then let inflation winnow away the cost of that debt? I managed to capture James's answer on camera. If you want to hear it, just go to Wealthion.com slash Turk. But before you do, please take a second to support this channel by hitting the like button and clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Thanks for doing that. Okay, now you can go watch James's bonus answer over at Wealthion.com slash Dirk. Thanks for watching.